Ah, the Commodore 128, the peak of 8-bit computing. The Commodore 128 was Commodore's final 8-bit computer, released in 1985. The Commodore 128 not only has twice the RAM, but also has twice the number of CPUs and twice the number of video chips, as well as a little over twice the number of basic commands. So then it must mean that the Commodore 128 is twice as awesome as the C64. And the C64 was already pretty awesome to begin with. So here are 10 random facts about the good old Commodore 128. So I think anybody who's even remotely familiar with the 128 knows that you can enter C64 compatibility mode by powering it on while holding down the Commodore key. But did you know that if you powered it on while holding down the run stop key, the Commodore 128 will boot to the built-in machine language monitor? This can be really handy if you uh, like mess up a poke in your basic program and you screw the computer up by poking the wrong value at the wrong memory location. Like if I do like poke 0 comma 10, which messes with the memory banking, and now we just got a bunch of garbage on the screen. And uh, if we press reset while holding on the run stop key, it'll restart to the monitor. Now we can just type X to get out of the monitor, and our basic program is still there in memory. If we were to just press the uh, reset button, we would lose our basic program. But by resetting by holding down run stop and going to the monitor, our basic program is left intact. And then hopefully uh, figure out why it made the computer lock up and uh, fix it. I often hear that the 80 columns on the Commodore 128 was a bit of a flop because you needed an RGBI monitor to take advantage of it. But that's not entirely true. Looking at the pinout diagram for the RGBI connector for the 80 columns, you can see that pin 7 is labeled monochrome. This basically just sends out a monochrome composite signal. And there are cables you can get, or you can build your own that have the RGBI connector on one end and an RCA connector on the other. This will allow you to use the 80 columns with any composite monitor, albeit it will be in monochrome. And this was mainly meant so you can use the 80 columns with monochrome composite monitors like this one. It actually looks pretty good. So all I had to do was buy this 9-pin connector on Amazon, and then I took this random RCA cable and connected the inner conductor to pin 7, and the outer conductor to pin one for ground. And uh, there you go. I can now use the 80 column chip on really any composite display. For best results, I do recommend using a monochrome one. So here's a pretty famous Easter egg. If you type sys32800, comma, one, two, three, comma, four, five, comma, six, it brings up this screen saying brought to you. And then it lists the hardware and software developers or actually more like Herdware, because Bill Hurd famously led the design team for the 128. As another slightly more obscure Easter egg, if you go into the monitor and look at memory location F63F5 to F640B, you can also find the names of several software developers. There are actually a few slight differences with the font on the Commodore 128 as opposed to the 64. Several of the lowercase letters, like I and J, and uh, there might be a couple others, have been slightly altered to make them more readable. As you can see on the 128's keyboard, there is both a shift lock key and a caps lock key. So what's the difference? Well, if I switch into mixed case mode and then press shift lock, when I type a letter, it'll be in uppercase. But if I go to like type a number, it'll type the uh, symbol that's above the number because shift lock is literally the equivalent of just constantly holding down shift. So it'll capitalize the letters, but it'll also shift and it'll print the symbols when you go to type a number. But if I hit caps lock, as you can see, all the letters are capitalized, but I can also type the numbers and you know, it'll have, have it actually type the number and not just the symbol above the number. So only the letter keys are shifted, or at least they should be. All of them are shifted except for Q, so uh, that's a little bug in the first revision ROM for the Commodore 128. This would be patched in later ROM updates. This 128 has the original 1985 ROMs, which has the caps lock Q bug, which can be a little annoying. Did you know that there are actually two different versions of the Commodore 128D? 
First there was the plastic Commodore 128D, which was only released in Europe. Not only was the case made of plastic on the original Commodore 128D, but it also had this nifty carry handle on the side, and the keyboard snaps up underneath. The original 128D uses the same motherboard as the flat model 128, and has like a separate daughter board to control the disk drive. Obviously I don't have one of these machines, so this is a random picture I stole off the internet, and I couldn't really find that great of a picture, or at least, you know, one that doesn't have the main board obscured by an RF shield. As you can see, there's the exposed disk drive controller board, which is basically just a regular 1571 controller, and then beneath it, underneath the uh, metal RF shield, is the main Commodore 128 board, which as I said earlier, is the same as the one in the flat model 128. Later in 1986, Commodore released the Commodore 128 DCR, with the CR standing for cost reduced. Some changes with the DCR is that they moved to the newer revision SID chip, the same one that was used in the 64C, as well as the newer VIC chip. And probably one of the biggest differences is that the case is made of metal, and there's no carry handle, sadly, and the keyboard doesn't snap up underneath, as well as the board inside is a bit different. The 1571 disk drive controller became integrated with the main board as seen here where the floppy drive is plugged right into the main board. There's no separate controller board. To match the higher intelligence of the new Commodore 128, an Apple IIc would have to add three more IIcs to expand to 512K. Commodore was really pushing this whole expandable to 512K thing in the marketing for the Commodore 128. It was mentioned in several of the commercials like you just saw, as well as they also like mentioned it on the box. Too bad it was a total lie. It has never really been possible to expand your Commodore 128 to exactly 512 kilobytes. Commodore did offer several RAM expansion modules. First was a 1700, which contained 128K of additional RAM. The second was a 1764, which was really meant more for the 64 because it came with that extra power supply because the RAM expansion module drew a bunch of power. And then there was a 1750, which contained 512K of RAM and would upgrade your Commodore 128 to 640K. And uh, none of those RAM expanders would actually bring you to exactly 512K. They either bring you to 256K, 384K, or 640K. So there's a bit of a miscommunication between engineering and marketing. Finally, did you know that hitting Control G on the keyboard will make the computer make this cute little chiming sound? Hopefully you can hear it, because it is rather faint. And you can include this keystroke in your print statements like many of the other keystrokes in Commodore BASIC. And this can be very handy if you want to just add a simple like beep or chime to your BASIC program. And you don't have to like use a bunch of pokes. So anyway, that's just about it for our 9, I think, random Commodore 128 facts. Hope you enjoyed the video, hope you maybe learned something, and I'm sure there's things I missed, so feel free to comment that below. And I know I haven't uploaded in quite a while, and uh... Yeah, sorry about that. I've been working on a number of, like, programming-related things. I've really been getting serious about 6502 assembly language. 6502 assembly is something that I've dabbled in for a while now, but I've really been getting, like, seriously into it recently. And I've been making some, like, well, quote-unquote demos. I don't know if you'd really call them demos, but they're cool little programs that I've made and learned a bunch from making, and... They're, they're kind of neat and kind of silly. Now the one that's playing in the background is my most recent one. There's some sprites and a sine wave, and the sprites are just moving along the sine wave. Here's another one. It's about opossums, and uh, it's I made this as part of an inside joke with a local computer group. I actually ended up learning quite a bit from making this little demo, which was really just a shit post. <laughs> Here's something that I made a couple weeks back, and I'm probably going to do a whole video on soon. And that is, I wrote the famous 10 print character string 205 plus random yada 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 random maze program entirely in 6502 assembly language. And I mean entirely, not just like picking a random character and calling FFD2. This does not use any kernel calls whatsoever. Anyway, those are some of the things I've been up to recently. And uh, as usual, thank you very much for watching and have a great day.